Good morning, it is day two of week two of Mr. Butcher Homeschool. Just want to say we're so glad that you're here with us and we're going to make a start on the learning. We know what we begin with, it is early bird maths, year three, four, five and six. Here are your questions for today and if you're finding your year group quite easy, why not move on to the year group above? Try those questions and if, even if you're doing really well at that, then it's a question of speed. How quickly can you answer those questions? So why not time yourself? As soon as you start, start a timer, then when you're finished, think about how long it, it took you to answer those questions. Off you go. Now time for my favourite part of the videos, and I think they're yours too. We're going to do some shout outs. Like I say, I have to write these down because there's so many of them. And if I don't shout you out today, please don't worry. There are lots of episodes ahead, lots of opportunities for us to recognise that incredible learning that you are doing at home. So, on with the recognition of your wonderful work. Let's start with Macy. Here is an example of your absolutely fantastic artwork, you and I, I, I could guess that a lot of your family are super at art from what I've seen, so great work here. Moving on to Evie, this is a wonderful example of your writing. You've been sending a lot of work in and it's, we're so pleased to see what you're doing, so well done Evie. Um, over to a big recognition, a big well done to Poppy. Well done on your descriptive work. I absolutely loved reading your description of the view outside your window. It sounded wonderful. A great use of personification. Super stuff. Next up, oh, some delicious baking from Boyd. These looked absolutely fantastic. I wish I could have tried one myself because they look, look super. And well done on your home learning. It's been brilliant to see. Well done, boy. Great job. A big well done to two brothers, Harry and George. You sent in your home learning and it looks absolutely fantastic. So great job, boys. Really proud of you. Well done. Next, we have some wonderful artwork from Mrs. Lynch's art lesson. Well done to Evie. This looks absolutely brilliant. And I love that not only have you done the unicorn, you've done the background and the, and the area around it as well. And it's been coloured in. So great job, Evie. Fantastic. And it's wonderful when you got in touch to tell me how much your whole family's been enjoying our episodes. So great job, well done to you and your family. What a wonderful example of geography work we have here. This is Daisy. She built this globe puzzle together and was able to work out where everything should go due to her fantastic geography knowledge of the world. Well done, Daisy. Great job. A big year three shout out to Fran. Your baking looks absolutely fantastic. It looks brilliant. Well done on following the recipe. You have done an excellent job. Big recognition to Reese as well. You followed our recipe. Your work and those look absolutely delicious. I would have loved to try one. Well done, Reese. Great job for you. Then take a look at this. This fancy Easter artwork here from Alyssa. It looks absolutely brilliant. I would love one of those. Very, very creative. Well done. Great job. Word of the day. Stupendous. What is the definition? Can you use the word in a sentence? The athlete's performance was stupendous in the last race of his career. Before we move on to today's work about squared numbers, I just want to recap factors very quickly. Let's take a look here, it says factors of six. So I need to find the numbers that when you multiply them together, make six. So I'm gonna write six here. I know that one times six is six. And another factor pair, I know that three times two is six. So the factors of six are one, two, three, and six. Have a go at this activity to recap your knowledge of factors. And 
And now we're going to look at squared numbers today. Your main activity is to do with squared numbers. But what is a squared number? Well, just like they used to say on Blue Peter, here's a little something I prepared earlier. Let's go. Today we are going to look at squaring numbers. Now, you see the number in front of me is 3 and then a little 2. Like that. And some of you will be thinking, well, what does that little 2 mean? Well, the little 2 actually means squared so before us we have the question three squared now what does squared even mean three squared is the same as doing three times three whenever you square a number whenever you see the little two next to it just means times that number by itself so three times three is 9 therefore 3 squared equals 9 but I know that some of you will be thinking well why why does that why is it squared what what's the shape got to do with it now we said that 3 squared equals 9 and the reason 9 is now a square number is because if you had 9 blocks you can make a square out of those blocks. 2 squared equals, it's the same as 2 times 2, and we know that is 4. So 2 squared equals 4. Now, if I had 4 blocks, I can make a square out of those blocks. So that way I know that it's a squared number. So let's go for another one. 6 squared. 6 squared equals, well, 6 squared is the same as 6 times 6. If you know your six times table, you'll know that is 36. So that is how to work out square numbers. time for this week's cooking challenge and before we start the new challenge i just want to say a little bit about last week's challenge it was amazing your work looks so delicious goodness me i was dreaming about those easter egg buns by the end of the week they look absolutely unbelievable so well done and thank you to everyone that took part now we have a new recipe for you that's a little bit different and because it's hard to get ingredients right now with the situation that we're in Maybe you could consider changing and swapping a few ingredients for something that you've already got in the home. So, here is a picture of what we're going to make. Wow! Don't those look delicious? Remember, the link to the recipe can be found in the description below. I cannot wait to see your pictures. When you've had a go at making them, please send them in. We'd love to see them. So, now we move on to literacy. And I was so impressed with your descriptive writing last week. It was absolutely fantastic. And we're going to share more of those on Friday's uh, episode because we're going to have a bit of a celebration of the learning we've gone through so far. But we're moving on to instruction writing. And instruction writing has lots of little skills that we need to learn about before we can write a set of instructions. And the first skill we're going to look at is, we're going to look at imperative verbs. Imperative verbs are verbs which change a sentence into like an order or a command. So I have two sentences here. Slice the cake, spread the butter. Where do you think the imperative verbs are? in these sentences. What are the words that turn them from just a sentence to a order or a command? Yeah, that's right. Slice and spread. Now, a quick activity for you. We've already talked about the cooking challenge this week. I'm going to show you some of the instructions to make that wonderful recipe. Can you find the, imp the imperative verbs on this method, on this set of instructions? Take a look, off you go.
Now, your activity is very simple today. I want you to come up with not five, not 10, not 15, but 20 imperative verbs. Think about orders and commands you would give someone. Or you might feel particularly bossy, you might be bossing your sibling about, think about the order and commands that they give you. Think about the orders or commands that your grown-ups give to you. So just stay at home, wash your hands. We've heard a lot of those in the media recently. So how many imperative verbs can you think of? Try and write, write as many wrote down, but we want to at least 20, because when it comes to instruction writing, these are going to be really, really helpful. So 20 imperative verbs, let's go find them. Time to work on our uh, novel again, which is The Explorer. Now we're gonna read the next chapter in full. I'm then going to ask you two inference questions. Inference questions are the tricky ones, remember? But they, they are, to find those answers, it, it's not gonna just hit you straight in the face. It's not gonna be totally obvious, like in a retrieve question. You've got to listen carefully to any clues that will help us work out those inference questions. So, on with the story. We're gonna briefly recap the last few pages that we've already read so that I can read all of the chapter for you. The chapter is called The Den. It was ferociously hot and he was still alive. Those were the first thoughts that came to Fred as he opened his eyes and found himself staring straight up at the Brazilian sun. Instinctively, he looked down at his wristwatch, but the face was cracked and the minute hand had fallen off. The two girls were asleep next to him. Both of them were covered in blood and scabs, but they were breathing easily. Con had her thumb in her mouth. There was a host of dragonflies in luminous blue and reds dancing around them. He thought they might be attracted to the blood, but there was no sign of the little boy. Max was missing. Max! Fred whispered jumping to his feet. There was no answer, no movement, except the burr of dragonfly wings. Fred's heart started to pound. Max, he called louder. Lila stirred in her sleep. He ran to the edge of the trees. There was no trace of the boy. Max, he roared, staring wildly around. What? Max looked up. He was lying on his stomach behind some fern-like plants next to the vile-smelling puddle, plashing his fingers in the water. Max! Fred ran over to him, wincing as, once of his, as one of his ribs protested sharply. You haven't been drinking that water, have you? Max stared up at Fred as he approached, then screwed his eyes shut and let out a scream that shook the baby flesh in his cheeks. Across the clearing, Lila gave a yell as she startled awake. That's not very flattering, said Fred to Max, but it was possible, he reckoned, that covered in blood and soot and with less eyebrow than usual, it didn't look very reassuring. The boy kept screaming, barely drawing breath. Lila jumped to her feet. Max, she called. What's happened? Sugar, Fred thought. He knew that you should give people sugar for a shock. Do you want a sweet? He had some mint humbugs in his pocket. Please stop crying. He fished the sweets out. His hand came out to wet. There was a cut on his thigh and half dry blood in his pocket and the mints had spent the night marinating in it. He grimaced and put one in his mouth. The taste hadn't been improved, but the sugar gave his blood a twitch. Do you want one of these? Fred spat on a corner of his shirt and polished one clean. It's a mint. No, I hate mints, said Max. It's the only food I've got. Oh, then I'll take it, said Max. He said it like a lord accepting a peasant's bread. Here, said Fred. He put it in the boy's sticky hand. Eat it slowly if you can. Max sucked, sucked loudly. His nose began to run down his lips and onto his chin. Max, Lila called, come here. Come on, said Fred. The boy's face was intent on working on the mint. His eyebrows furrowed in concentration. He looked very breakable. Fred felt his chest tighten, but he said only, you should probably blow your nose. I don't blow my nose, said Max. They walked both limping towards Lila. It's not a thing I do. Well, I think you should. No. Max licked the snot off his upper lip and added it to his, to his mouthful of mint. Five-year-olds were not easy to argue with, Fred thought. Max had a sweep of dirt encrusted on his cheek and his eyebrows turned up at the corners. It gave his face a mischievous tilt. Fred hooked his finger into Max's shirt collar to steer him from thorns and what looked like rabbit droppings. The ground was mossy, speckled with patches of grass and creeper. One of the trees had scarlet flowers that had fallen and red carpeted the forest floor. Sitting among the flowers, under the bright white sun, Lila and Con were arguing. 
You, boy, what's your name? Fred, called Com. Come and tell this girl she's completely wrong. She thinks, began Lila, flushing. Obviously, I think we should go back and wait near the plane, said Com, in case they see it from the air, so they can rescue us. It makes more sense to stay here, said Lila. She pulled her knees up to her chin. We'd just get lost trying to find our way back, and I don't think anyone will see the plane. They don't know we cr where we crashed. They'll have to search the entire jungle. We're on our own. She fixed her eyes on a dandelion-like plant, fierce and unblinking. We'll have to find a way to get to Manaus ourselves. Fred looked at the girl properly. She had a scratch across one side of her narrow face, and hair woven into two dark plaits, one of which had been charred in the crash. She wore a scarlet skirt and a blood-red top, both now stained grey-green. She looked about his age. She was scowling at Com. Con glared back. That's crazy. We need to stay near the plane and wait to be rescued. My family will have sent dozens of planes to search for us by now. A hundred planes, probably. But, said Lila, where we crashed is burnt by the fire. Half the trees are charcoal, so there'll be no animals. We don't need animal friends, said Con. This isn't a fairy tale. For us to eat, finished Lila. And back there, there's... What? said Con. There's the pilot. He's dead, said Con. She seemed genuinely puzzled. He can't hurt us. Lila spoke very quietly, but Fred was surprised by how authoritative she sounded. We should make camp here. No, said Con. That's completely illogical. Fred, asked Lila. You get the deciding vote. No, he doesn't, said Con. That's not fair. One person shouldn't get to decide. She glared at Fred from foot to chin. Not unless he agrees with me. Fred looked around the clearing again. The air was fresh and the sky above them a blue that does not exist in England. He was just about to answer when he saw that at the far end, where the forest grew thick and tangled, four trees had fallen together, their tops meeting in a point. The very tips of the hairs on the back of Fred's neck began to rise. Do you think there's anything odd about this clearing? He said. That's not an answer to the question, said Tom. Why? asked Lila. Those trees, he said, over there. What about them? They fell over. That's what trees do. But they don't look like they fell. To me, said Fred. He ran across the clearing. A sense was rising in him that something was strange. His curiosity pushed aside his fear. The largest of the trees was immense. Its trunk was thick and tall as Nelson's column in Trafalgar Square. Three smaller trees leant against the thicker one. Each had grown a few feet from the necks in a rough square. Their branches entwined and darkened by green creepers. Leave it alone, Fred, called Con. Stay in the open. There's something odd here. He ran his hand down one of the smaller trees. At the base was a mess of fern-like plants and a few mushrooms. He pushed the ferns down and felt his stomach swoop. The three smaller trees didn't have roots. They were logs 15 feet high, each carefully tipped against the central tree. He could see where they had been hacked with an axe or a machete. Ferns had grown or been planted. Fred thought, at their bases, disguising the places where the cuts showed. A den, breathed Fred. What did you say? called Con. Fred pushed at the vines that stretched between each of the legs, each of the logs. It's like a tent, said Fred. A den. He bent down, ready to push past the foliage. No, don't go in there, said Con. Came out in a burst. It's not that I'm scared, but please don't. It's not a reasonable risk. Fred stared at her. Oh, what? He had never in his life considered whether a risk was reasonable. It sounded like something his headmaster would say. There could be anything in there. Jaguars, a snakes, a rats, said Con. I can't not look, said Fred, astonished. She might be right, though, said Lila. About the snakes, be careful. I'll look, said Max, grandly jumping to his feet. No, you absolutely won't, said Lila, grabbing his wrist. You're staying right here. Wow. So, a den has been discovered. Bear that in mind when you answer the inference questions that appear on the screen now.